Welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, latest edition of uh, the ORF series called uh, Neighborhood Scope. Uh, we deal, uh, we try and deal with one country every month uh, and uh, we've been thinking for some time uh, actually uh, to do uh, uh, one of these shows on uh, Bhutan uh, because we haven't done it in the past. Uh, and uh, let me be very honest, this has nothing to do with the recent developments in India-Bhutan relationship because a lot of people would probably try and join two and two together. My colleague Aditya, uh, who is out here on the panel, uh, has been speaking to me about this since early last month. So, uh, so anybody who's trying to draw any kind of parallels between the Prime Minister's visit or likely visit to Bhutan, uh, this really has, uh, this was decided quite independently. Uh, and and uh, I think it, we have, I must admit, we have been a little remiss in talking about Bhutan. But I think one of the reasons for that also has been uh, that, uh, you know, we normally talk about countries with which we are having a lot of trouble. And uh, with Bhutan, of course, uh, there's a very special relationship uh, that uh, both countries share. Uh, and perhaps it would not be an exaggeration to... Uh, claim that uh, Bhutan uh, is one of India's closest friends. Uh, but I think friendship also needs to be constantly worked upon. Uh, and and today's, uh, sh uh, today's program is actually uh, partly an endeavor in that direction. So we want to see where exactly both countries stand right now uh, and what are the future uh, kind of uh, roadmaps that we can explore uh, to take this relationship forward. We have a great panel with us today. Uh, we have uh, 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 a former MP from uh, Bhutan, um, Dr. Pasang Dorji. Uh, he's a scholar who has also worked on uh, India-China competition, uh, but I think he brings with him the perspective both of a scholar as well um, as a political leader. Uh, we have uh, Chen Chodema, uh, a journalist who, who has been reporting on Bhutan uh, for over a decade now. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Medha Bhisht. Uh, she's a professor at the South Asian University and has worked extensively on water, climate and energy sector issues. Uh, she's also been a former colleague of mine uh, from IDSA days. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we have... In some ways, I am the master of ceremonies, but he's the guy who's pulling the strings from behind the scenes. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, Aditya GS, um, who's an associate fellow at the ORF and works uh, uh, very dedicatedly on India's neighborhood, focusing on Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Bhutan. My name is Sushan Sareen. I'm a senior fellow at ORF, uh, and I deal with uh, what I call depressing issues like Pakistan. Uh, but uh, but I think today we have something positive to look forward to, uh, talking about uh, Nepal. But let me first start with uh, Aditya. Uh, normally I come to him last, but today I think I'm going to come to him first. Uh, and and uh, the reason I want to come to him first is because I'm a little curious uh, about the timing of the Prime Minister's visit. Now, I completely understand that when he became Prime Minister in 2014, the first country he chose to go to was Bhutan, uh, which I think was a very strong signal about uh, uh, what has now been called India's neighborhood first policy. I think it also uh, uh, was, was a sign of the salience that we give to our relationship with Bhutan. Uh, but I'm a little curious because at a time when elections are just uh, about to happen in India, uh, very critical elections, all elections in India are actually very critical from municipality to national elections, but nevertheless, uh, general elections are very critical. Uh, and the Prime Minister choosing to go uh, for his last foreign visit, uh, you know, uh, in his second term to Bhutan at this point in time, uh, I'm a little curious, what exactly is it? Now, we saw when the Bhutanese Prime Minister had come, uh, the body language... Uh, you know, between the two prime ministers uh, told its own story. And then the prime minister promises that he's going to go to Bhutan. But the timing is very curious. Uh, do you know something that none of us know? 
I, I would start by saying that, you know, India's neighborhood policy, uh, despite its own uh, hits and misses, I think Bhutan shows uh, what India's neighborhood policy is and can be. It, it is a perfect example of how uh, efficient a neighborhood first policy can be on how, how efficient a neighborhood policy would be, uh, especially considering the huge geographical disparities and resource disparities that is between India and Bhutan. Um, now, building upon where, um, you know, uh, when, when this neighborhood first policy began with Prime Minister Modi coming in, uh, in 2014, uh, he went on to travel to Bhutan as his first visit in 2019 again. And now again in 2024, in a way, you know, to rebuild on this special relationship that's been uh, carefully nurtured over six to seven decades, rebuild our development cooperation that's been uh, consistently, you know, be, uh, reshaped according to what Bhutan needs or what Bhutan, uh, uh, you know, requires at this point in time. Um, and uh, this, this especially if you go back to 1958, this was a similar kind of uh, leadership to leadership, uh, uh, you know, establishment or leadership to leadership relations that worked and gave a very good uh, message to the public, to the broader public saying that India is Bhutan's friend and it is there for Bhutan, uh, you know, uh, in, in all its uh, uh, success and all its uh, uh, problems. And I think this is quite timely for uh, Prime Minister Modi to make this visit because um, despite elections, it is a strong political and personal commitment that is being shown up by, uh, shown by our leadership. And most importantly, it is crucial to see uh, note that Bhutan is at a crossroads today. Um, and by what I say, uh, what I mean by crossroads is not necessarily positive. Uh, there are three crucial developments that are happening within Bhutan. Uh, one is uh, concerning its foreign policy, especially uh, towards its north. The border intrusions and uh, you know an aggression, aggressive China is continuing to stare at Bhutan with an undisputed border, you know, with an unresolved border dispute. Uh, and this has continued to increase in the last uh, uh, last 10 years or so. Uh, and uh, one example of it was already seen with the Doklam crisis in 2017. Um, China raised fresh claims in 2020 in the um, in, in Bhutan's uh, east for the first time. And these kind of concerns, you know, uh, there, there has been push from China to end this border dispute, end this border negotiation uh, with, with excessive use of sticks, I would say, rather than carrots. Uh, and this is something uh, that Bhutan is seeing an impact of. Bhutan is now keen on ending its border dispute with China uh, at the earliest. So in 2023, we saw three kinds of... Um, uh, you know, three uh, expert group meetings take place in one year. And then we also saw the 25th uh, uh, round, uh, 25th border negotiation, which happened for the first time since 2017. So that challenge exists. And uh, India and Bhutan have been closely coordinating and cooperating with each other on the border dispute as well, uh, because both the countries see a mutual uh, threat and a mutual security concern, which is China. And uh, this signal is one from the Indian side to show that we are here to cooperate with you and we are here uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, to help you overcome this broader obstacle that is. Uh, and then the second bigger issue is is the economic uh, issue in, in Bhutan. Uh, the average economic growth has not been more than 2% for the last five years. Uh, the uh, unemployment rate has been around, uh, youth unemployment rate especially has been around 30%. Um, and uh, Bhutan itself is uh, is facing uh, uh, another challenge, which is a third challenge quite interlinked with the economy is, is mass exodus. It's it's migration of people uh, living leaving Bhutan to Australia or Canada in 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 masses, and uh, that itself is uh, you know uh, for a population of seven lakh. Uh, people leaving the country in twelve thousand or even in fifteen thousand numbers is is quite a bit. Um, you know, stressful for its economy as well as its demography. Uh, so, uh, Bhutan, if you if you observe, it's uh, you know in the last two three years, the kind of negotiations and discussions they have been having with India is not just the border negotiations, but also uh, rethinking and reshaping the economic engagements and trade engagements it has with uh, the rest of the South Asian region and especially through India. Um, so, uh, the last time the king was here, he not only visited uh, uh, Delhi, but also Assam and uh, and Mumbai. Uh, one to show that uh, the the Gelefu project that is coming up is is closely interlinked with India and closely interlinked with ec India's economic growth. Uh, and even if you see the current prime minister's visit, he again traveled to Mumbai. Um, and this is again uh, in a way to say that a lot of economic Indian investments are coming into the Gelefu region, or there are attempts to bring in more Indian investments into the Gelefu region at this point in time. Um, 
so uh, there there is a more need and push for connectivity there is a push for um, you know um, uh, fresh uh, uh, trade posts fresh integrated check posts uh, to increase trade to increase economic engagements and also uh, to link bhutan with the rest of south asian economies and southeast asian economies especially uh, bangladesh which we are now seeing in 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 uh, as india was playing a role in hydropower cooperation between bhutan and bangladesh and recently we also came across the report that uh, bhutan is now opening up a uh, Uh, a special economic zone in bangladesh itself so basically it shows that bhutan is trying to overcome its economic stress bhutan is trying to overcome its aggressive neighbor trying to end its border dispute and i think this is a very timely visit uh, which if it had happened at this point in time that prime minister modi wants to show that india is here with bhutan and this neighborhood relationship uh, and and this relationship that we have uh, matured over a point in time this win win cooperation kind of a development cooperation that we have nurtured um uh, despite its misses will continue to go on and uh, india is here to support and we have also uh, planning to pledge uh, huge support uh, huge sum of uh, around uh, 9000 crores in for bhutan's 13th five year plan according to bhutanese media reports uh, so basically which is twice what the 12th and the 13th uh, or the 11th and the 12th five year plans uh, assistance was Uh, so this this shows that India is there for Bhutan and it is trying to help Bhutan overcome this situation. Just a very quick uh, mm-hmm. follow up, Aditya. Uh, what I what I am interested in knowing is is this more about messaging and consolidating what we have already done, or is there some big takeaways which are likely to come as a result of the visit? Because that part is not quite clear. Is right. it just messaging, signalling? uh that we remain very close uh, friends allies partners give it whatever name you want to give it or is there something much more that is likely to come out of uh, the visit uh, which probably will take place very soon my 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 thinking is it's it's a mix of both right first it's it's essential signaling that india is trying to show uh, to bhutan that we are here we are trying to help you uh, especially even at a time when elections are going on uh, our prime minister is willing to um, visit a neighboring country and spend some time there and uh, and reboost the uh, diplomatic relationship uh, now the second aspect of is if do i see anything significant do i sense anything significant probably in terms of economic cooperation probably in terms of more uh, projects or 13th year fi uh, uh, Or, or the assistance for the 13th five year plan is what i sense in terms of border negotiations i wouldn't say there would be a radical departure especially when it comes to talking to china uh, because we see a consistent trend in bhutan regardless of what government is in uh, is in power they try to end the border dispute that is at the um, at the end of the day that's in in the core interest of what bhutan wants and i don't think there will be a significant departure uh, in terms of foreign policy whether bhutan wants to open negotiations with, uh, uh, a diplomatic relationship with china or not i think the the trajectory is clear bhutan wants to open up a diplomatic relationship with china uh, although we don't know to what extent and uh, in what nature uh, but uh, i don't think there will be a departure on that front i do sense that on economic front and cooperation wise we might see something significant coming up Dr. Dorji, if I might uh, turn to you, uh, given your twin hats, uh, both of a scholar who's worked on India-China competition in the Himalayan region, as well as uh, a former uh, member of Parliament in Bhutan, uh, you know, you come with a very unique perspective. So uh, let's get the let's talk about the elephant in the room, uh, so as to speak, or the dragon in the room, as it might be called. Uh, what is what is the sense uh in in bhutan of how this contestation uh between india and china uh is playing out as f- from bhutan's perspective how is how are how are people in bhutan looking at this contestation and if you might just shed some light on where exactly uh things are as far as the border question is concerned the negotiations with china are concerned Dr. Dorji. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 just to make a disclaimer, I am no longer in Parliament nor in politics. So what I say here will be uh, and view a view of independent scholar here. Uh, 
Dorji, that is even better because now you can speak even more freely than what yeah. you could have mm-hmm. if you were still a member of parliament. Yeah. So, uh, you asked me a specific question on the contestation between China and India in the Himalayas. That is a geographical, geopolitical compulsion. And how we look at the issue also depends on what paradigm you use to assess the dynamics here. From uh, my point of view as a scholar on Bhutan, Nepal, India, and China, I think uh, now the dynamics are shifting a bit because uh, as China gains more influence in South Asia and the region, and people in the Himalayas, including Nepal, Bhutan, are also beginning to understand what China actually is as an economic power, as a regional power, and also a resident geopolitical power in South Asia. So when it comes to the border, uh, I think uh, Indian scholars, intellectuals, and also the uh, people in the security community, strategy community, have been discussing a lot. But here, what is missing is the the view of uh, people like Bhutanese scholars have been missing for a long time. The stability of Himalayas, stability of Bhutan-China border is in the interest of both India, China, and also Bhutan. My take is that if Bhutan and China can resolve the border issues amicably, it is good for the Indian security interest. At the moment, there is a high level of strategic mistrust between India and China, obviously, given that they are rising powers, competing powers in the region. Uh, Here, uh, there is a tendency that anything that Bhutan does with China will be bad for Indian security. I think this is not necessarily a right perspective to look at the issue. My take is that if there is a stable relationship between China and Bhutan, it does not mean that there will be some disturbance in Bhutan-India relationship. Bhutan-India relationship is a time-tested relationship. And even if Bhutan develops good relationship with China, Bhutan will always have deeper interactions with India because Bhutan is situated on the southern Himalayas. The access to the whole world for Bhutan is through India. So India-Bhutan relationship will always remain as special as it has been and as it is now. But here, the point is, As small states in the region, I think I can see that there is a shift in the Indian foreign policy of late. For example, India's relationship with the West. Maybe the smaller states in the region would want to be treated by India as it would want to be treated by the West. So I think Going back in time, the 1996 I.K. Gujarat's doctrine that India should not expect equal reciprocity from the smaller neighbors to maintain the stability on the periphery still applies. And I think that has been very well taken care of by the Indian foreign policy community and the people who shape the opinions. So as far as the border of China-Bhutan border is concerned, I think time will come that where the strategic interest of all the parties involved will converge and there is a stability in the region, which will also enable China-India relation to flourish as well as their global ambitions to achieve. Thank you. I will leave uh, at this. If there is a follow-up question, I will answer. Uh, Yes, I do have a follow-up question. Uh, And that has to do with uh, the the, the border issue, of course, uh, is is, uh, under discussion right now. We haven't seen a final uh, picture of what is likely to be settled. Uh, But then you did mention about, uh, you know, the kind of uh, 
the economic model of China or or, or Chinese investments, uh, you know, engagement with uh, China on the economic front. Uh, is there any concern in Bhutan? Uh, because there is the experience of other countries, uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, for that matter, even some of the other countries, Nepal, to some extent, uh, where uh, Chinese investments uh, have been quite intrusive in the sense that uh, uh, there has been some uh, talk of taking over territory, uh, debt trap diplomacy, stuff like that. Is there any concern in Bhutan uh, that uh, if the Chinese come bearing gifts, uh, those are not exactly going to be gifts? Uh, I would say there is no concern because there is no Chinese investment in Bhutan. So uh, I think the the level of concern, the degree of concern will depend on how the future scenarios develop. At the moment, if you look at the trade architecture of uh, Bhutan, China, Bhutan, India, the triangular trading relations. Almost more than 85% of Bhutan's trade relations is with India. And of course, India and China have thriving uh, economic and trade relations, but Bhutan, though it uh, it uh, trades with China, but uh, comparatively speaking, when it is compared uh, with India, it's very minimal. So I think this question would be a little preemptive and I don't see any concerns at the moment and time will tell because if if the engagement, level of engagement develops further, so maybe that will be the time when we might have to discuss this issue. At the moment, I don't see that type of wariness or the concern. Chenchur Dema, if I can turn to you now, uh, you know, uh, you look at you look at uh, Bhutan's uh, internal politics. Uh, just to give us an idea, just walk us through on uh, uh, how uh, within the domestic political framework, uh, one this contestation between India and China is playing out. Because uh, at least uh, insofar as Indian media reports are concerned. Uh, there was a feeling uh, with the previous prime minister that he seemed to be leaning more in favor of China uh, than India. Maybe those feelings were misplaced. I don't know. Uh, you can shed uh, more light on that. Uh, but there was this sense that, you know, he was leaning more uh, in, in favor of China. Uh, so we just wanted to get an idea of, is this an issue in domestic politics or uh, what exactly, uh, you know, are the axes around which domestic politics is currently uh, revolving? Shushan, thank you so much. Uh, you know, like when it comes to China, the topic itself, you know, it has always been sensitive in Bhutan, you know, and the way we have like as a journalist, you know, from a journalist perspective, we have always been, you know, careful about when we write about this. Now, I don't know on what basis you're saying, you know, like uh, the previous prime minister, Dr. Lotus Ring, had, you know, incl uh, inclination towards the China and not towards India. And now that the PM, the, the present PM has more towards India and not towards China. But I know like in Bhutan, you know, like uh, I don't think we have that kind of a division or thoughts, you know, like where, you know, like certain politics uh, uh, party, you know, which uh, forms the government has to do with the China. Uh, whatever, you know, like whenever there has been a, uh, like, uh, as far as I'm concerned, like the last, the, the last border talk that, uh, you know, Bhutan had with China was in 2022. That was the last thing and much, not much of the details were revealed and we do not know much also because it was a closed door. And yes, like, you know, Dr. Lote, I don't know, like, uh, has like, you know, it's only it's it has been like international media you know like i i'm sure like you, the reason why you're bringing up this uh, question is because of what had happened in back in france you know when uh, one of the media outlet actually you know like uh, uh, from the one statement that he said was blown out of proportion i think i would say it was uh, exaggerated which he didn't it did not mean it actually when he clarified back home so i don't think you know any of the you know like uh, political leaders who have come to the uh, 
power will have any kind of this because like what dr parson said earlier that you know bhutan has always been you know like i mean to say like the india has always been a very good friend of in uh, bhutan in terms of good or bad you know india has always been there but uh, as far as i'm concerned i have worked for uh, from the first government till now none of the you know like the uh, prime ministers have you know openly or indirectly has shown any inclination uh, with inclination or you know favoritism towards the china we have always been neutral you know what needs to be done it has been done but you know there has never been a favoring or anything like that uh what exactly then are the axes around which politics is being played out in bhutan uh, what are the big issues of the day is it as aditya was mentioning earlier uh, the uh, the somewhat anemic uh, economic growth is it that is it narcotics is it migration uh, is it development uh, what what are the big issues uh, that that are troubling people as far as domestic politics is concerned Oh, okay you know as far as like uh, like i was saying you know because i'll be talking through a, ju- a journalist perspective the issues that has been you know for constantly we have been battling is first thing is the narcotics second is the domestic you know economic problem that we have you know the um uh and the third one is migration you know like uh, aditya had mentioned in earlier uh, introduction when he was speaking he said you know like uh, for a population like ours you know with, uh, with just a 700 thousand people and then you know every month every like week we see a lot of people migrating for a greener pasture you know and why is that happening is because we have a problem with the economic and how big the problem is we are not very sure because you know like uh, uh we uh, because you know the government has not uh, come forward and said you know oh we are having this problem that you know the economic is uh, crashing or something like that but we have seen you know the attrition rate in the uh, civil servant the teachers shortage is there the doctors shortage is there you know and uh, the nurses are leaving and and the, the the you know when we talk to these people the only concern they have is you know that you know they they want to you know rebuild their uh, future they want to have a you know better future and that can only be done when we migrate to uh, when we migrate to places like australia canada usa uh, middle east and all these things and then you know like a uh, these are the actually you know major problems that we are currently facing and then of course we are also talking about the reserve you know the remittances that the inflow of the re- remittances is very low and uh, and having to you know like uh, uh, we are import driven country and there's not much to export so that's you know the imbalance in the uh, um in the scenario of the you know import and export these are the things actually you know major problem as of now we are talking about and i think this is an excellent uh, segue to you professor bisht uh, so like okay india has uh, made sorry india has made significant investments uh, to develop bhutan's uh, hydroelectric potential uh, there is talk of uh, other infrastructure projects that uh, we might be developing out there uh, and which we are developing out there but what else how how do we uh, or what are the things that we need to do to address some of the issues that chencho was talking about uh, in the sense that uh, if there is migration taking place is there something we can do about it or is it do we just say that fine you know there are people from all over the world moving to all over the world and bhutan is not any different in that respect or uh, is there something that Uh, we need to address or we can try and address uh, to whatever extent that's possible one second uh, you know on the on the whole uh, uh, issue of uh, unemployment uh, what what are the various options we can explore uh, in so far as unemployment is concerned uh, is there something which more which we can do because you are somebody who's worked on with some of these issues uh, so i was wondering if there are some new ideas on the table or are we just you know trying to uh, play around and toy around with the old ideas big chunky investments uh, which are not really going to be making uh, or touching the lives of people in a very direct way but in a much more indirect way 
your perspective for the question um you know i'm just listening to the debates i think they're very interesting and particularly when i think we are looking at bhutan right now a lot of development is happening and um uh, before i get into the specific question i think there are two issues here one is bhutan's orientation of course towards south which is india and it's a double edged sword and the other are these border negotiations which are going on and inevitably at some point of time both will get intertwined now having said that we can discuss about this later because i think there are interesting developments there and one cannot really miss this question but uh, you know when we're talking about relations or bilateral relations a country can always have orientation towards a particular country and in this case we're assuming that it's india but i think uh, the devil um, lies really in the details and the details are primarily found in diplomatic practices so um india is the biggest development partner of bhutan and of course um, as you rightly pointed out there is uh, in fact a lot happening but i think it's not really uh, and and particularly you know with sering topke coming into power who has his interest in southern bhutan who's very uh, uh, forward looking um, i would see that this would be a very important phase in india bhutan cooperation particularly when it comes to economic issues and the nature of development partnerships but i think for uh, india it's it's important um, uh, and and for uh, uh, watchers of india bhutan relations it's very important that what are the details and what are the conversations on the ground uh, for instance i mean you know if you just pick up any bhutanese newspaper uh, there is a lot of uh, noise uh, around uh, the suvidha app in particular which is also known as the gunda tax um now under the trade and transit treaty uh, the free trade agreement um uh, you know all the goods which are to be uh, moved on to the third countries they shouldn't have any tariffs or taxes levied on them but with this uh, suvidha app by the west bengal government the but these truckers particularly are facing a lot of problems where they saying that around 2500 Uh, 5000 nagalchuma just in terms of you know opening and putting a slot of the truck and while the app was primarily uh, to facilitate more efficiency it's actually been causing more problems now it's here that the devil lies therefore i said the devil uh, essentially lies in details and this is particularly uh, i think a very unique feature of south asian diplomacy particularly india's engagement with the south asian neighbors when it comes to implementation there are a lot of issues and there is where the grievances really start from um so on uh, the, so this is just one example where i think um, you know how things really get translated on the ground is a reflection of the diplomatic culture of a particular country and it's here that misperceptions particularly around the border area start and uh, they really do play an important role when it comes to impacting the nature of economic diplomacy and economic diplomacy i would say is uh, while uh, you know it's, uh, it's it's considered to be essential but i think it really hits down to the political dynamics of a particular country you know your constituencies of uh, politicians are all dependent on it and that's how the framings you know of a particular country as the other and in this case india would start so um Um, you know uh, this is just one example which is in fact uh, uh, quite a hot debate um, this has been uh, taken up by bhutan uh, you know to the indian authorities too and i wonder what's really being uh, done here and i would say that as we move on to this next very i would say uh, enthusiastic phase of development economic partnerships the devil will essentially lie in details and we need to watch that because as i said you know the border dispute and uh, the developmental issues with india and what's happening there with china are not really separate you know they have to be intertwined at one the second one about the kind of issues which are emerging now if you really again look at the nature of partnerships between india and bhutan particularly the three s's which are coming up regarding the startups space and um, i think um uh, it's uh, um stem 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 okay. yeah so um, particularly on uh, hydropower you know which was a single issue area uh, now it's more branching out to more renewable energy um, education is 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 one factor and i think you know 
India-Bhutan development partnership definitely has matured. It's becoming a multi-pronged uh, area. Uh, there are uh, various ways of converging. For instance, I mean, even when it really comes to uh, countries like Japan and Australia, you know, there are good potential partners there. So even with India's strategic interests with other countries in Asia, there is a convergence out there. So I would say that we're definitely on a bright road, but. Um, uh, uh, the devils have the devil has to really be in the details and how these developmental partnerships really translate and open and in the ground is something that we'll have to watch for so, so let me just ask you a follow up because that's a very interesting point you make and that is um, that is one crib which many of our neighbors have yeah. that uh, you know uh, when it comes to actually delivering on the ground uh, maybe uh, there is a big gap between uh, what we are saying and what we are being able to do. And a lot of it has to do with what happens at the local level. Probably not so much at the at the level at which, uh, you know, things are negotiated, but at the local level. So, so the question for you would be uh, a twofold one. One, how much do you think is there a recognition at the top levels uh, in the Indian policymaking establishment? And we have a couple of very distinguished diplomats out here, and maybe I'll throw this at them uh, at the time of the Q and A. But in you know, from your perch uh, as an academician, as somebody who studies the area, how much do you think there is a recognition that what might be negotiated at the top levels? has a problem when it comes to delivery on the ground. And that becomes extremely critical because if we are talking about an SEZ coming in uh, at, at Galifu, uh, that SEZ will not work if you have the kind of problems you're talking about. You know, it, it's going to be counterproductive. So, so how, wh what is the sense you're getting that is there a move to try and address some of these issues or, uh, you know, uh, given the fact that we have a government in West Bengal, which is not exactly on the best of terms with the government in Delhi, uh, you know, it's just too bad. Grin and bear it. What? Uh, I, I mean, the complexity of center-state relations, I think it's very, very essential, um, central, I would say, to India's neighborhood diplomacy. And I think there is a full awareness. Uh, you know, with the bureaucracy here uh, uh, in India, that uh, things uh, do really, uh, uh, you know, have that difficulty uh, in terms of translating to the ground efficiently. But I think more to that question is that how you're really dealing with it, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the implementation, you know, of, um, of effective policy translation, I think is still a challenge which uh, needs to be recognized and which need to, needs to be acted upon in a proactive manner. So um, I think there's much which needs to be done because in my own follow-up, not only with India Bhutan, but also with other issues, I feel that well, there is a meta narrative of diplomacy, the first neighborhood policy, for instance. Uh, but I think there is always a gap when one really looks at the micro narratives or when one really looks at the local newspapers, you know, coming in from a particular state and looking at the issues or looking at some reports uh, which are in fact published or, or which are out by the public, uh, by the civil society in the public domain. Um, you know, when we read that, then we, at least I as a researcher, I really do uh, get um, the, uh, the, the idea that there is a gap between the meta narrative of diplomacy and the micro narratives, uh, you know, around the border areas. And I think uh, that really needs to be uh, looked at, uh, which I think is not really a case. But there is something, I mean, I... Um, I don't know whether I should utter it here, but I think there are interesting developments, you know, which are taking place. I mean, because uh, this issue was raised before and uh, Dr. Pasang Dorji had said uh, uh, regarding the role of China. Now, I think there are very interesting developments there. And one of the things which I've really seen coming up in the last few months, I've not written about it, of course, but there's something that I've been following. I was telling you, Aditya, also, was, is, is regarding green mining, which is happening. And uh, Bhutan is really getting into Bitcoin mining. And I think uh, and if you look at the Forbes report, for instance, you know, some of the reports say that, um, you know, around uh, $220 million were primarily uh, given by China as Bitcoin chips. Um, and uh, that's, that's interesting uh, because, um, uh, you know, for green mining, what you're really doing is that you're using hydropower. 
and I'm just trying to maybe really talk about the, we, we're talking about China, and it's very important to understand how China, we're talking about China being a de facto and a de jure re a reality in South Asia. We're talking about Chinese inroads into South Asia. And I think uh, with Bhutan uh, particularly, we've talked about the economic issues before. Uh, Bhutan is uh, primarily right now facing an economic crisis. Much of it is really dependent, yes, on hydropower, which gets exported to India. How does it really generate resources? And I would say green mining is coming up in a big way as a savior in terms of the self-reliance which Bhutan really needs to have. So that's an area which is developing, which is becoming in, uh, of, of great interest to me as to how it will, in fact, play out. Let me just uh, come to you, Chencho, on, on, on this whole issue of uh, green mining, uh, because, you know, uh, it does have an environmental impact. Uh, okay, it's with hydropower, fine, and uh, which is somewhat environmentally friendly. But even then, uh, it does have a, a massive impact on the environment, which, of course, none of us can see. Uh, and, and this uh, also brings me to a point of uh, the issue of tourism, developing tourism in Bhutan. So, yes, it's... Um, it's a place a, a lot of us would want to go to, uh, but I think a lot of us can't afford. Uh, but the fact of the matter remains that uh, if you have really expensive tourists coming in, then the kind of facilities you set up for them uh, is also not very environmentally friendly. How do you balance the two things out? Number one. Number two, uh, if, if you do develop tourism in a big way, uh, then what does it, uh, what, how do you handle the environmental impact of that? Uh, that's the second question. Uh, and I wonder uh, if people have thought this thing through in Bhutan, because if you want to address unemployment, tourism gets you the maximum bang for the buck. Uh, but is this, um, is this a question which is being debated in Bhutan? Uh, or is this kind of peripheral to the main topics of discussion as far as politics goes. Thank you. Uh, you know, Shashant, you know, like uh, Bhutan has always, you know, branded uh, uh, when it comes to tourism, you know, you know, uh, be it in the international media or or in any look, uh, even in the local media, we have been like talking, you know, like Bhutan has become uh, one of the most uh, expensive destination to visit because of the death, you know, imposed by the government. And now, you know, and over the year, we have seen a lot of changes in this policy of, you know, like uh, there, there was a time when, you know, the SDF was, you know, increased to 250 and then there was, uh, you know, less arrival of uh, tourists and then, then, then the people in the tourism um, uh, industry, they started making noises. And then again, then, the, then there was a change the change in the in, uh, in the you know in the SDF you know then it was br brought down to hundred and then you know fifty and all those things and then we started to see uh, uh, the change in the number of tourists coming to Bhutan and then even the present government you know they have like a pledge that you know like the, uh, uh, that along with the Department of Tourism we that that the government is trying to bring in three hundred thousand you know uh, tourists. Uh, annually you know the number is quite ambitious actually you know but the question is are we ready for that you know like you mentioned do we have the services to provide actually you know because you know uh, uh, because like you know for example you know punakha is a, the punakha is one of the most visited you know dist uh, district in the country because of its landscape and the you know and also you know and also one of the places where we where we have a lot of resorts uh, resorts hotels and all this thing but the question is again and are we able to give all these facilities that, you know, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, SDF that we rely on them, right? And then, like, you know, like, uh, uh, and you were talking of the employment, you know, like, in fact, you know, tourism, they have more than 50,000 of people working under tourism and hospitality. But during the pandemic, you know, they, these were the people who were mostly affected because there was no tourists coming in, so the hotels were closed, you know, and then the, the tour, uh, tour, uh, tour guides, the tour operators, they have, you know, nothing to do. So, you know, and now, even now, you know, like, um, 
and that like you're talking about the environment the the you know like um uh, the government has you know has come up with this rule you know not exactly as a rule but then kind of a uh, uh uh to set an example you know like uh, if you go for a hike you know you bring back your trash with you because otherwise there are certain you know places sites you know where like most of the people visit for example taksang is one place you know tiger's nest where people a, a lot of both international and regional tourists they go and visit but then you know the aftermath of the arrival of uh, so many tourists leaves behind a lot of waste now who takes care of that waste so now the now that you know the tour operators and also the concerned agencies involved in tourism they have come up with this idea of you know uh, uh, idea of you know uh, you know carrying your own trash bags and you know this is one thing you know and uh, another one was about you know like a uh Yes, of course, like, you know, like uh, Bhutan uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, besides hydro power, tourism is another uh, revenue generator for Bhutan, for a small country, you know, because like I said uh, in my earlier uh, thing that, you know, Bhutan do not have much to export, you know, the only thing uh, besides uh, export, besides few, you know, commodities that we export, tourism is another thing. And, you know, now uh, when uh, we the, we as a journalist, we always question the government and the agencies concerned that, you know, when we are, you know, you know, uh, reviving $250 SDF or like now bringing it down to $100, you know, are we able to, you know, are we, are we also, you know, giving them, uh, giving them what they are giving us, you know, there are so many factors that has to be looked into, and the government is, you know, very, you know, like um, very positive that they uh, they are really working, uh, uh, they're really working uh, into, you know, like improving the hotel services, the tour, uh, that uh, uh, what you said, guide, uh, you know, the guide uh, to, you know, uh, designate uh, experience guides and all these things. So, you know, of course, I'm not saying overnight, you know, Bhutan cannot be that, you know. Uh, a brand destination where you 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 get what you uh, pay you know but still bhutan is really working hard to ensure that you know uh, to give them you know like um, uh, good uh, good services in return and of course like bhutan has been giving and i'm sure like you know over the time you know with experience and you know through experience you know we learn and then when we learn then we will be able to you know give uh, the better facilities and services can just come to you and ask you about, you know, uh, we spoke about earlier, we spoke about uh, the kind of connect that there is between uh, Bhutan and India, uh, a kind of a civilizational connect, the fact that geography favors India more than any other, uh, more than China. Actually, there's no other country left apart from India and China. Uh, but geography favors India. We've had, uh, we've had a connect uh, for for so many decades, uh, uh, with 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 Bhutanese students coming to India for education, uh, training missions in Bhutan, and what have you, how much of this continues to hold, uh, you know, or bring the two countries together? Because apparently, in recent years, we've seen uh, India is no longer the favored destination for students, for example, and students, uh, you know, ensure that there is a continuing connect between countries because those same students will go back uh, to their home country and, you know, that connect stays alive. Uh, so how much of that connect remains robust? Uh, and what, in your opinion, uh, needs to be done to ensure uh, that that connect is not broken? Because we've seen a lot of students go to way out places uh, and not come to India anymore. Dr. Dorji. Uh, in one of the recent uh, press reports, there was a number that actually showed how many of our students are studying in different countries around the world. And uh, I think uh, India stands at uh, as one of the top, still as one of the top destinations. And also the number of people working in India Bhutanese people working in India is quite a sizable number out there. Now, here, the crux of the question that you asked me was why that connect is losing, the possibility of losing that connect. 
I think this is very social in nature and economic in reasoning. Because as human beings, when you get better opportunities elsewhere, they always tend to look at better opportunities. For example, most of the students who are migrating to Australia, they look at from that economic and educational point of view. And the gist is, if India offers better work and educational opportunities and experiences to Bhutanese, then what Canada, Australia, and US have to offer, definitely I think Bhutanese will choose India for so many reasons. Number one, because of the cultural connectivity. Number two, because of the people-to-people -people relation. And number three, closer to home. So I think when I was in Delhi a couple of years ago, I, I had a friend who who was saying that one of the biggest concerns when it comes to people-to-people -people relations between India and Bhutan could be the decreasing number of Bhutanese students studying in India. I was telling this should not be a concern. I think this could be an opportunity for both to look at how to actually make the people-to-people -people exchange more innovative more engaging. So I think we, Bhutanese, nobody can say that Bhutanese students should go to India, not to Australia. I think this is a very individual. And uh, we, we cannot say that unless, unless we have something to give them, maybe messages could go wrong at the same time. So maybe India could also look at in what way the connectivity can be improved. And oftentimes, I have been arguing the about the politics of proximity. I think India enjoys much more lever and the space than rest of the countries that our Bhutanese go to because we are nearby to each other and also we know each other far better than the most of the countries that Bhutanese go to. So maybe that mental connectivity, economic, social, physical connectivity. And quite disappointing is that when we talk about connectivity, I think so much of both policy and intellectual discussion and the discourse have been on the physical connectivity. For me, I think this is very, very secondary. Of course, it's important, but I think we have to look at from the mental connectivity point of view as well. How can we connect to each other? And how can we do more with less? Thank you. Ideas, connectivity, cultural connectivity, people-to-people uh, -people relationship. How do we strengthen it? You are a professor in South Asia University. Uh, you are in the hot seat. Uh, you are supposed to be actually making South Asia University very attractive for uh, students from across the region. Uh, so what, 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 what ideas do you have? On how do you think we can strengthen uh, this aspect of the relationship? I mean, when it comes to Bhutan, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, uh, I think it's one of the countries with, uh, in South Asia, uh, and uh, Bhutan is an exception there. I think India and Bhutan both really have uh, uh, great connectivity. And, and yes, I mean, I do agree with that. While I've been talking about physical connectivity, you know, the mental connectivity also becomes important. And um, having said that, uh, I would say, you know, uh, the kind of at least the macro frameworks which are there regarding education, regarding skill building, you know, all of the programs which are there are um, sort of geared uh, towards this. Uh, but um, I mean, two specific things which I feel, um, at least in terms of really looking at uh, Bhutan. Uh, the first is, I think, what uh, Dr. Dorji really started with, um, and he started with uh, that, you know, there are not many people uh, in Bhutan who are writing about the issue and the public domain 
in a way is crowded by Indian intellectuals. And I think uh, there has to be more sensibility, more sensitivity in terms of how we really describe Bhutan in our writings and how we talk about Bhutan. It's a, a very proud country, which is very proud of its sovereign and uh, territorial integrity with its own mind. Bhutan is an excellent case of small state diplomacy. I keep on telling my students that if you want to read about small state diplomacy, you know, you have to start with Bhutan. Um, because uh, if you really look at the trajectory right from, I would say, the 1950s, the way Bhutan, in fact, really put it foot down, put it, put it foot down when we were really negotiating the 1949 treaty, you know, it was very uh, clear about what it really wants and what really needs to be bargained for. Similarly, look at the uh, operation all clear. It almost took Bhutan like 10 to 15 years uh, to, um, you know, negotiate. And in fact, India was insisting that, you know, you should let the Indian boots, you know, inside the Bhutanese territory. Bhutan said no. It tried first negotiations and when due to its own internal compulsions, then it decided to flush the insurgents out. So I think, you know, there is great potential in terms of understanding Bhutan and the way we describe Bhutan, the way we, uh, um, you know, communicate uh, 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 Bhutan uh, is, 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 is very important. The second thing I think where, which we also need to understand is that Bhutan also has a very indigenous way uh, the way it has, in fact, really translated some of its ideals or intellectual legacies into policy domain. Um, so, for instance, um, I, I mean, that's another aspect in terms of ideas influencing and, you know, what does Bhutan really have to offer to South Asia? Um, you know, that becomes very important. For instance, take the idea of GNH, you know, it's a middle path. I think we, when we're talking about sustainable development, how do you strategize sustainable development, you know, in the context of South Asia? I think Bhutan can provide immense intellectual leadership there. So, um, in terms, uh, uh, you know, these are some of, I think, the university discussions, or at least in terms of the intellectuals who are watching India, Bhutan, need to be aware of that. That we're talking about Bhutan, uh, you know, it has a very strategic outlook and it has found ways and ways, uh, ways and means to navigate that space for itself, and that should be recognized. The second thing is that, you know, again, go back to the borderlands. And I keep on telling, again, the students, because we do have students from Bhutan uh, in South Asian University. Um, uh, you know, you need to, uh, in fact, uh, not only look at India's foreign policy, you know, from the capitals, you know, between what's happening between uh, um, uh, uh, New Delhi or, 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 or Thimpu, New Delhi or Dhaka, but really in the borderlands. And I think there is where the connectivity lies. So even in terms of the border huts, which are there, uh, you know, uh, giving that some policy space. And, you know, in fact, in my own um, uh, you know, interactions with some of the people. There are people, uh, women especially in the Northeast, who really want these border hearts to be, uh, to open up. They want more interaction with Bhutan on that front. So I think there are ways, but I think the first essential step is to recognize that, uh, you know, uh, Bhutan is a wonderful country with a very clear strategic mind. I really see its uh, diplomacy uh, really being opened or being playing it in that way. And I think that requires recognition and also the intellectual legacy it has to offer in terms of, um, you know, the GNH or even the Vajrayan identity, which is so distinct to Bhutan and how it can really look at some of these issues. And um, it's, uh, I always do look with inspiration to Bhutan in that context, because I think there is a mindful of ideas there where Bhutan can actually offer a leadership role. Uh, before I go into when uh, Aditya, let me just turn to you. I think uh, Professor Bish makes some excellent points. But I, I would imagine that we have to recognize that there has been pragmatism on both sides. Uh, uh, I think India has always recognized that Bhutan has agency of its own. Uh, I think we've been very pragmatic. Uh, Dr. Dorji talk, spoke about the Gujral doctrine. I think that's pretty much part of how uh, India has... Uh, has uh, interacted with uh, her neighbors uh, so and 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 with bhutan we've recognized that there are certain compulsions there are certain you know it has its own culture it has its own reasons for doing certain things i i, I don't think that's been a, a kind of a problem as far as the two countries are concerned uh, pragmatism has been there on both sides in fact in many ways bhutan has been probably one of the most pragmatic uh, neighbors of india uh, they, you know, uh, unlike some of the unmentionables uh, in India's neighborhood, uh, 
you know, they've realized certain realities of power. Uh, they're comfortable with those realities of power. And they've been able to negotiate, uh, you know, within keeping uh, within the parameters of those realities of power. And I think that's what good diplomacy and pragmatism is all about. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we now have to recognize that we need to move forward from where we are. We, we've been in a good sweet spot. Uh, we still are in one, but how do we maintain this? So what are the ideas you have to throw on the table? Because, you know, you come from a different generation. Uh, you are the guys who will inherit the earth. It's not the meek anymore. Uh, so what, what, what do you think needs to be done going forward? Any ideas? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I would, I would basically um, start by saying that uh, there has been a lot of pragmatic recognition from both the sides, right? And, and basically to reiterate what you're saying, and that's basically what India and Bhutan have understood and have, um, you know, uh, inculcated in their foreign policy approach. Now, how do we move forward from here is a big question because that also depends on how Bhutan's um, you know, economic situation or Bhutan's domestic situation plays out. For now, uh, there is an increasing um, tendency to move uh, or, or there should be an increased push towards more and more people to people connectivity, right? Um, Again, where from Dr. Dorji started or where from uh, Dr. Bist has said, I, I, would, I would rather say that the connectivity that older generations had with Bhutanese, right? It's, it's quite different. Today, I speak to a few Bhutanese of my generation and they say my parents used to speak in Hindi, but I don't. Right. And that is a difference that we see in today's generation because they want to be more global. They want to be uh, or, or they want to call us local, uh, be more global, but also be uh, local in terms of their embrace, their Bhutanese identity. And I think the younger generation should understand that there should be more sensitivities uh, that we have to uh, embrace when when we are dealing with Bhutan and Bhutanese. I mean, uh, it's it's just, you know just going with the narrow or zero sum mind game of saying that it's it's just if China makes inroads, you know, uh, it's a loss for India. I think China and border negotiations are one part of it, uh, but there is a whole different angle to India Bhutan relations. Uh, now the second thing is I think we have been tapping on the uh, on on the uh, buddhism or a mahayana buddhism skill to a very limited extent i think probably we could push for a more minilateral approach within the south asian countries uh, i mean i understand that the, the 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 forms of buddhism in in probably in nepal or in or in sri lanka are quite different from what happens in bhutan but i think there there, there is a common point and that is india and i think we could embrace that minilateral approach uh, for people to people relations for even economic relations um, and I think another suggestion I would give is be more, um, uh, probably India should uh, approach this in a more, um, to, to an issue that's been very contemporary with especially unemployed youth. Uh, there is a strong tendency for youth to not be involved in hydropower uh, you know, projects and they see India's investments as basically uh, uh, you know, projects that are unemployable or basically where they don't want to get employed in. Right? And I think we should find more and more private sectors to invest in. Uh, for, for example, the information uh, communication technology is one such aspect. Yeah? What happened to Druk? Because I remember growing up, jams meant druk, squashes meant druk, uh, mustard meant mustard sauce meant druk. What happened? I don't see it anymore. Any ideas? Anyone? Uh, Dr. Dorji, uh, Chencho? I don't know what's happened. It was fabulous products. Uh, I that uh, I think uh, uh, to be honest, I really do not know what happened to those those products we also remember but we do we don't see any more so maybe it was uh, purely from a business uh, sense that uh, it got out of market and uh, we also have to consider that uh, since uh, bhutan's uh, cost of production whatever we produce the cost of production is quite high and maybe because those products could not uh, could not survive the market competition. This is this is the educated guess that I can make, but I don't have the information why they actually went out of the market. Yeah. So sorry. I was I was just saying. You know, probably with the with the new 
special administrative zone coming in there is more because bhutan also wants to explore into um, industries and into investments that are not uh, you know uh, probably contributing more harm to the uh, environment so probably the service sector is something that they're looking at and i think india should seize the moment uh, invest more so that uh, even the migrate you know the, the basically also help them not no, no, the youth to not get migrated more and at the same point in time um, you know probably if those youth are returning back they have an opportunity to start their life fresh in Bhutan uh, uh, we had a very good uh, session but now we'll go in for a Q&A so uh, whoever wants to ask uh, please identify yourself and please identify whom you're putting the question to um, I'm Sripati I'm a research fellow with the Indian Council for World Affairs I just got two questions um, to our friends from Bhutan uh, do either of you sense there is a sh mark shift in attitude between the older generation and the younger generation on all issues, including foreign policy? One, because uh, that's one. Uh, the second is that um, when you are looking at uh, issues of unemployment, uh, how far will the Bhutanese government be willing to attract investments in those areas, including tourism, that may not be keeping with the existing policy on environment? Because on BBIN, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, uh, <coughs> Nepal, uh, road transport uh, project, one of the reasons why Bhutan withdrew was the concern of emission and pollution. If that is going to be hindered, how are you going to attract investment in other sectors? Because connectivity becomes a major issue. Thank you. It was an insightful discussion. I'm Madhuri, Professor Madhuri from Delhi University. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll make it brief. Uh, one that Can you just it, limit yourself to two okay, because okay, sure. So one basically, I want to know that is the package deal still on the table that was there in 1996, in the sense that uh, you know that time uh, Beijing had put across that if we do recognize your sovereignty over. Uh, Pasam Lung and Jakar Lung, if you give up your control over Doklam and Dharmana sector, is it still uh, online today? Because uh, what I feel is that there is so much of construction going on in the northern part of Jakar Lung from 35 households to now it is going to uh, perhaps go up to 235 households. And this is a fact. Uh, so this is one question of mine. A uh, second question of mine is, is it's a hypothetical question that is Bhutan uh, ever going to go, uh, I hope not, the Nepal way? Because Nepal is currently balancing, navigating the balance between India, China, and the United States. Although relationship between Nepal and India have been acrimonious regarding defense deals are concerned, uh, because, uh, you know, what India is doing is Again, what uh, Professor Medha said that we have been actually, uh, we need to be more soft towards our neighbors, our South Asian neighbors, especially with Nepal and all, especially as far as military sector is concerned. So linking that with Bhutan, that I want to know that in the coming times, as far as military is concerned, with a little bit of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the small amount of military power do they have, they have, is it going to sustain in the coming times? Because if we establish diplomatic relations, uh, if China has a, a, a diplomatic relations with Bhutan, Bhutan would need all that it has, especially air power and everything. So that's that's my big concern. And in culture, I would like to add to ma'am that civil society organizations have always been a bone of contention in Bhutan, as well as the state of private media. I think that needs to be, uh, you know, um, taken stock of because that has always been problematic in Bhutan. Thank you. I'm all your questions were to our friends from Bhutan. Okay, uh, so fine. Uh... Hello. Myself, Namgyal, and I'm a Chinese studies student from Delhi University, and I'm a Tibetan. So, so my question is for Dr. Pasang Dorje. Since we talk about Bhutan, India, and China, but no one talks about Tibet, you know, despite Tibet stands at the center of these three countries. So, sir, my question is, sir, what should be the Bhutan stand on Tibet? Because uh, without a solution to the Tibet, there is no any permanent solution to the border issue of Bhutan and India. We all know that China has a bad history in their, what you call, respecting the agreements. So, so what should be the Bhutan stand on Tibet? And 
Moreover, sir, I think Bhutan have some kind of a moral obligation to us Tibet, sir. We practice Vajrayana Buddhism. Bhutan is also known for their Vajrayana Buddhism and the land of a Guru Buche. That's it, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, Aditya. Uh, I'm Anangsha Matra. I'm a journalist. My question, uh, there are precisely two. First, we have seen a tripartite agreement and framework between Nepal, India, and Bangladesh on power sharing, where Bhutan is highly capable of. So is there any quadrilateral power sharing uh, you know, uh, framework we, uh, we may have in, in coming days? Secondly, the rail work, the Galifu and Kokrajhar rail link. How will it transform the regional connectivity, especially with the states, not just Assam, India, Northeast, as well as Bengal, and you know, the adjunct state? Uh, greeting everyone. I'm Deepak Sharma, a student at University of Delhi. I have two questions regarding the status of ethnic Nepali population in Bhutan. Uh, first to Meza Bismam. Ma'am, since 1980s, 100,000 or more ethnic Nepali people have been expelled from Bhutan, which by 1996 accounted for 40% of Bhutan's population at the time, who were forced to live in refugee camps in Nep Nepal. So how do you see India's mediation between the ethnic con conflict between Nepal and Bhutan? And a follow-up question to Dema, ma'am. I'm considering that these tensions have inspired militant attacks in Bhutan by organizations such as BCP. What role does ethnic Nepali population play in Bhutanese politics? Okay, Meda, I'll start with you. And then Aditya, if there's any question you want to pick up, and then we'll go to our Bhutanese guests. Okay. So just starting and I'll just pick up a few which you pick are, up whatever you want yeah. to ask. Okay, thanks. So I think on the issue of the package deal, I think that's the story of the past. Because uh, I really see Bhutan-China negotiations around five specific phases. I would say the first was the engagement phase. Then came the redistribution phase when the swap deal uh, was suggested. Then came the normalization phase, 2000s, uh, when uh, uh, China was also, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about, you know, opening um, the, an embassy in Thimpu. This was particularly, uh, um, uh, you know, around 2000. Um, the joint survey started. Then came the speculative phase when uh, China came out with the 1890 agreement, changed the frames of the discourse. China, Bhutan, India all came up with the positions in the public domain. And now we are in the implementation phase, which I guess starts 2021. So more or less, I think the dispute, as you rightly pointed out, the facts are on the ground. And uh, I really do see uh, that uh, uh, more or less there has been a compromise formula, which has been found and can talk about it more later. So, on the, um, you know, the Nepal way, I don't think so, uh, because Bhutan, I think it has a very distinct approach. It would never go the Nepal way. Bhutan has always done what Nepal has not. And primarily, it comes from the political setup of both the countries. And finally, I think the last one, because, and I'll give the others, you know, more a chance to respond to other questions. You know, the ethnic conflict question, and I think that's uh, one of the issues now no one really talks about because it's been diffused totally, right? <laughs> Again, an example of excellent way uh, that, you know, the issue was managed. And But I think if you really go and talk to the Bhutanese and try to at least get a Bhutanese perspective, they would say that, well, we were open to talks. We did went. We, we didn't we did go you know to these refugee camps in nepal but violence really broke out and uh, because of that we had to really uh, keep it at that so i think you know the political culture of bhutan is very very distinct one has to know that i was talking about that how bhutan in a way has evolved its own idea of nation building its own concept when it gets translated you know to the political domain and I think if it really comes to really respecting the three essential principles of Sa, Va, Sum, which is the king, the country, and the people, and you're within the boundaries, you know, you're well within what is called a Bhutanese citizen, because I feel a Bhutanese is not just a physical citizen of Bhutan, is as much a psychological citizen of Bhutan. And therefore, I think Bhutan needs to be studied in a very different way. So right now, I think the issue has got diffused, right? It's no longer in the table, it's no longer in the priorities. Unless or until the diaspora is very strong and they're strategizing around it, if, and if they form a network and, and a platform in terms of raising these issues at specific platforms, I, but that would be a long way to go. But as far as I think with both India and Bhutan, it's an issue which is no longer on the table. Aditya? So I'll try, I know this question was directed to uh, panelists from Bhutan, but I'll just uh, take this question of, is there any difference between the generations of how Bhutanese uh, look at foreign policy uh, uh, in, in this context. Uh, I, I, 
I had the similar question and in fact, uh, to get an answer, we had run a survey with around uh, 115 Bhutanese students, although we haven't published it yet, it will be out soon. Um, the, the survey say, is quite clear that a lot of people still see India as their primary development partner. A lot of people still see that India will be a future development partner. A lot of them have close relations with India. Most of them have visited India in the past. Uh, uh, and uh, they speak either one or the other Indian language or they understand uh, one or the other Indian language. But there is a sense of skepticism when it comes to uh, uh, over-reliance on India. And I think that's the only negative connotation that's being attached to India. But at the same point of time, there's, they are also uh, trying to move away from the P5 uh, uh, the P5 principle that Bhutan had been trying to follow. A lot of people are now willing to, uh, or basically advocating for more relations, diplomatic relations with all of the P5 countries, um, is is what I sense from the survey that we have conducted. Um, now, uh, answering the question of Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and Bhutan uh, quadrilateral, I don't see any possibility. What? Because uh, I don't see any potential benefit coming from that uh, kind of quadrilateral because we already have a Nepal, India, Bangladesh for a hydropower uh, trade for the very reason that Nepal is having surplus hydropower and Bhutan, uh, sorry, Bangladesh needs energy. Now, in a similar fashion, uh, we are seeing Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, India, where again, uh, Bangladesh is trying to import uh, hydropower from, uh, from uh, Bhutan. Uh, but Again, between Nepal and Bhutan, I don't think they would want to trade surplus hydropower with each other, right? Um, and then uh, Gelefu region and its impacts. I, I mean, again, it's it's quite in the early phase to say what are the potential impacts it might have. But yes, I mean, for the fact that uh, look at Gelefu not just as a connectivity point between India and um, and Bhutan, but also look at look at it as India, uh, especially from the northeast region, uh, then Bangladesh and and uh, and also the rest of Southeast Asia, right? And, and that means that there will be a lot of uh, more people-to-people -people interactions in the coming years if the project is implemented successfully. And you'll also see more economic interactions and trade boom uh, between these, especially between Bangladesh, Northeast India, uh, Nepal, uh, sorry, Bhutan and uh, India. Uh, Dr. Dorji, any of the questions you want to answer, there have been plenty put. I, I think most of the questions has been have been answered, but uh, I will try to uh, give some uh, some maybe my views on the, Professor Maduri asked uh, whether that uh, border talk between the Bhutan and China that 1996 package is still on or off. Uh, before I answer this, maybe the, I sometimes think that. Maybe when we talk about this triangular relations between China, India, and Bhutan, maybe sometimes when we boil down to our bilateral relations with India, India-Bhutan relations, maybe sometimes when we, if we can take out the China factor, maybe we will actually get the real essence of the special relationship. So, here, uh, when it comes to 1996, uh, that uh, package deal, it, we are talking about almost 30 years, and so many things have happened. But I, I do not know whether it is on or off because the discussions are going on, and we have no privy to the uh, what's uh, privy to what's happening. So my guess is that it can be. It can be. I think. Uh, both the countries are trying to solve the border issues amicably, keeping in mind the interest of India as well as important neighbor. And one thing that all of us, especially people who are in the scholarship in this area, need to keep in mind is that in the earlier discussion, one uh, there was a view which says that different political parties have uh, different orientation towards India and China. I think this view is quite, quite not correct view. Uh, Professor Bist was pointing out that the sensitivity in the international relations, I think the most sensitive people about their sovereignty are the people of small states. And here, when it comes to when it comes to sovereignty, I think Bhutanese can be as sensitive as any. Uh, people of small states. So here, 
maybe we can also look at how Bhutan and smaller states in the region could also contribute to building peace between India and China instead of that thinking that whatever these small uh, states do with either of the power will affect the interest of the other power. I think we have to go beyond this narrative because now the perceptions of people are also changing because as we have access to more information, I think the perception keeps changing. So maybe maybe we, the last point is that maybe we should, the best way to move forward is that maybe we should broaden up the scope for deliberations, discussion on the triangular relations, particularly bilateral relations between India and Bhutan. So if we try to stick to the past framework, this might not work. Because as I told in my uh, earlier comment, India's foreign policy stand has also been shifting, especially vis-a-vis -vis the West. So maybe I follow the smaller states in the region, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives. I think the I think the views of these small states are also changing. So maybe they want to be treated by India as India would want to be treated by the West. So maybe we could also look at this framework to understand uh, our relations in a deeper way. Yeah. Then the second, maybe I will, Namgel's question, what is Bhutan's position on Tibet? So here, I, I since I don't uh, represent any government agencies, I can give my view as a, as a scholar, like India and like so many countries, I think the position on Tibet has been consistent, recognizing one China policy. But as scholars, if we go deeper, the histories are different. So at the political diplomatic level, I think one China policy stands. And uh, uh, there was one question on tourism. So since Bhutan has not rectified BBIN, how will Bhutan be able to develop its tourism sector? So I think first we need to get uh, the, the policy, policy stand of Bhutan's tourism on tourism. It is high value, low impact. So when we talk about BBN, it's a different story now. So now, instead of thinking that Bhutan might not be able to develop its tourism sector without rectifying BBIN, maybe we can think that how can Bhutan develop its tourism without rectifying BBIN? So I think this we can look at from two angles. And I think uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there are a lot of possibilities because once BBIN is in, then I think uh, the, it will also have some associated challenges. So it is up to the governments to decide as time comes. Thank you. Come to uh, uh, Ms. Dema. Just a clarification. Actually, we've stopped uh, recognizing the One China policy for over a decade now. You'll never hear India mention One China policy anymore. Uh, so I think just as a clarification, I thought I should include that. Uh, but Chencho Dema, please, uh, any of the questions you want to take on and answer in your own way. <clears throat> Yeah, like uh, Dr. Pasuk was saying, you know, like most of the questions were already answered, but maybe I thought I'll just give a few points, you know, uh, about, you know, like uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, participants said about, you know, the change in the attitude towards the older and the younger generation when it comes to the concept of, you know, like uh, uh, when, when it comes to the concept of India, you know, like... Um, Maybe might be there might be some changes in the way you know the younger generation and the older folks they think about India and the foreign policies and everything, 
But, you know, like there is one thing, you know, that uh, really makes India closer to the heart of the Buddhist people is the Bollywood, actually, you know, more than the government. I think, you know, the government policies and everything, you know, the Bollywood actually has really had the has an impact. You know, that's like on a lighter note, I'm saying, you know, that is one thing that we are very close. You ask me, you know, like maybe like um, anyone here in the like in the, you know, in the panel, I mean to say in the uh, in the meeting today, you know, I think I will be able to give uh, more about, you know, like. Uh, about the Bollywood uh, music or Bollywood, uh, you know, the celebrities and then the songs, you know, because if you look at the, you know, like um, the southern belts of the country, you know, like uh, uh, we are very, you know, very near to the India, you know, we do our like, you know, the day to day shoppings from like India interaction, you know, they know how to speak our language, we know how to speak their language, you know, that's one thing that, you know, that keeps the bond of the two countries together. So, you know, no matter, you know, like how, far, like, you know, like, um, in the coming years, you know, people might have uh, different thoughts about uh, what Indian might think think about Bhutan or what Bhutan might think about India, but you know because of this, uh, you know the the situation and then the you know the locations everything that's really going to you know to keep uh, uh, keep on the bond of the two countries you know like uh, uh, stronger I think, and uh, another thing. Uh, yes, I, I actually you know this is completely an independent uh, uh, perspective as a uh, as an individual uh when the very moment you know there was a poster about the panelists you know who's going to be a panel and who's uh, who uh that you know that's going to talk about bhutan bhutan's issue and there was like a series of you know tweets i don't know who who that person was but you know a, a lot of you know like uh, negative comments on bhutan you know about like about the uh, about the refugee issues you know because the this uh, Nepali, uh, this refugee issue is very sensitive. We have never talked about, and you know, like uh, I think it's best, you know, let the you know the people who are best in uh, with the knowledge should be to uh, should be talking about, you know, whenever it's like Bhutan, the issue about Bhutan is there. The refugee topic is always, you know, associated. You know, we like just because we are from like just because we are talking on an issue, you know, does that mean that you know we have to you know really talk about this? So. That was something, you know, was very discouraging. And then like for once I thought, you know, I think I will not take part in this discussion because if this is how you're going to, you know, like uh, portray Bhutan, then that was uh, that was the thing. Yeah. Thank you. Connectivity, I think what ties us together is also trolls. So I think you've taken the trolls very seriously, but uh, those are the perils of modern day existence. We just have about five, seven minutes. Uh, I'm just going to overshoot the time. So if there are any questions, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to take. Please. Good morning, panel. Uh, this is Sahil. I'm from B.R. Ambedkar University. I'm currently pursuing B.A. in Global Studies. Uh, this is in respect to what Dr. Biss mentioned. What collaborative initiative between India and Bhutan in the realm of intellectual exchange towards sustainability have shown most promising outcome if there have been any sort of collaboration in that respect? If not, what are the possible domains that we can collaborate and how do these collaboration contribute to fostering a sustainable development in this particular region, uh, more specific to what has been happening to the environmental degradation in South Asia? Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Tanishk and I'm a student at University of Delhi and I'm pursuing major in political science. Uh, my question is to Mr. Uh, Pasang Dorji. Uh, sir, you mentioned that you respect one China policy and not consider Tibet as an independent entity. China has recently released a new map showing India's state of Arunachal Pradesh as its own. And while China does not come up with any map showing Bhutan's territory as its own. So what can we learn from Bhutan to avoid such things? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Padam Kumar Rasaili and I am from Bhutan. And currently, I am pursuing uh, my master's degree in South Asian University. So, um, uh, I am working on, as a, in dissertation, I am working on friendship in international relation. And uh, when we talk about all the concept of friendship and all uh, the, how the concept have evolved in the Greek society to have a very stable uh, a political affairs. So, in that sense, and when we bring like uh, China, Bhutan and India. So I am like, my perspective is for the regional, like how the uh, relationship between South Asian countries. So in this case, why can't we imagine like having a dinner uh, 
India, Bhutan, China together, why we always try to like who is inclined to which side or not. So my like my objective is to like the regional stability of South Asia itself. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Dorji, there was a question to you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, if I got your question correctly, you asked me what can you learn from Bhutan, right? I thought that uh, Dr. Professor Bist actually answered. I think one thing that uh, Bhutan has been sticking to when it comes to its regional policy or foreign policy, the neutrality and honesty. And of late now, the idea, talking about ideas, Dr. Bist was also talking about the intellectual legacy. I think Bhutan, Bhutan, uh, Bhutan has made a name for neutrality as well as trying to be a norm entrepreneur, something that we call trying to set the norms. So if we, if we try to look at the crux of Bhutan's foreign policy that is available uh, publicly, it says that it's one of the main foreign policies is to, is to propagate peace in the world. So actually that is a very broad foreign policy, but within that, since we are right between two big powerful countries, we must ensure a neutrality, a sensible neutrality. And that is what Bhutan has been doing all the time. And one thing that Bhutan has avoided is trying to pitch the powers against each other. I think that the type of that type of approach will not serve anybody's interest. And Bhutan has been very cautious about it. And even in the long term, in the in the future, I think Bhutan will never try to orient towards one power to hurt the interests of another power. I think that is not in the interest of the country as well as to the interest of both the powers. I think that something sometimes uh, as a scholar quite disappointing is that Indian media and some uh, some uh, scholars tend to jump to the conclusion that whatever Bhutan does with China is bad for India. I think sometimes we have to go beyond this narrative and look at the specialty of India-Bhutan relationship by taking out China from that equation. So I think then we will get the real perspective. Thank you. No, I think there's a lot which has been happening, um, you know, particularly in India-Bhutan. A lot of collaborations, recent collaborations, the collaborations in the past, I would say, you know, for instance, there is a medical seat which is, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, reserved for this something, you know, which has just come up, you know, in a sum. Um, then there was also a digital library at one point of time, you know, the Prime Minister in his last visit sometime, yeah, you know, inaugurated it. There's a lot of focus now on education, particularly STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A lot of focus on skill building. So I think a lot has been, a lot of, a lot of encouraging developments have been happening. Uh, then particularly when you look at the cultural sort of programs, you have the India-Bhutan Friendship Association. So, you know, that's what I said. I think Bhutan is really understudied. And particularly because you raised about the environmental issue there, there is this river, a very minor river, Saralbhanga River, which actually flows from southern Bhutan, you know, to, to Assam. And um, um, actually, what, and, and this, is, this was primarily led by the civil society out there. It was really a network of organizations where, you know, a check dam was constructed because there was a flash flood. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Bhutanese on the other side, the Bhutanese government on the other side had actually diverted the river. And then uh, it was primarily initiated by the civil society organizations. Uh, in India Bhutan Friendship Association played an important role in reaching out to the DM there in Bhutan. And then Bhutan, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 didn't really put the uh, dam. The dam was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, removed um, because, you know, a lot of uh, the uh, silt is there, you know, agricultural degradation takes place because of the collection of silt and, you know, that needed to be flushed out. The farmers also needed the water. There was a lot of voluntary labor you know, and they, in fact, the whole atmosphere, and it's a very encouraging case study which you might want to look at. So I think there are stories, micro stories there, which are in fact very, very encouraging when you look at India-Bhutan relations. So well, I would say it's, it's unfortunate sometimes when the China factor 
overshadows the nature of the special relationship there. But at the same time, one also has to understand that what's really happening around the northern areas is of concern to India to a certain extent, primarily because, you know, how do you really manage China and uh, the, the kind of positions it's really taken on specific border points. And that's, I think, a challenge for the Indian government to really look at. And I think, you know, there is a specific policy approach which has been taking place in India in that context. I'd like to add to it also, if I may. Please. I don't think there would be any possibility. I mean, looking like coming from an Indian perspective, I mean, look, we had our own terms of reconciliation with our hostile neighbors. What happened in Pakistan? What happened with China? Uh, in fact, what happened with China and the West? We, they accommodated China for so long and now China has turned out to be whatever it is. Now, the 2020 Gulf One clashes is just... Uh, it's just another example of what Chinese intentions are, what what actually is happening behind those beyond those closed doors, no one knows. And I think till that suspicion stays of what China does and what China is trying to do in India's neighborhood or what it is doing to India, I don't think that will be a possibility to have China, uh, India and other any any other smaller South Asian country sit together and have this negotiation. I mean, India was not even welcoming China as, as a member of SARC when a lot of SARC members did ask. Uh, a couple of SARC members did push for China as a member. And I think that kind of concern exists. And as long as that concern and suspicion exists for China, or legitimately for whatever they do, I don't think that's a possibility. To uh, the entire panel, uh, Dr. Dorji, Chen Chodima, Professor Bisht, and of course, uh, Aditya, who's put together this whole program. I think we've had a very good discussion. It's been very enlightening. Uh, to hear from uh, our guests from Bhutan as well as from Professor Bisht. Aditya keeps badgering me anyway, so it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of used to it. But yes, thanks a lot. And uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm very confident that uh, this will be the first in many such sessions that we will have on Bhutan. And we would certainly expect uh, Dr. Dorji and Chen Chodema to join us again. Uh, whenever we hold the next uh, round of discussions. Uh, but thank you very much for being part of this. And thank you yeah, to yeah, everybody yeah. who's come here today. In fact, uh, it's one of the largest uh, gatherings that we've had for any of these programs today on Bhutan. Uh, should tell you a lot about how important Bhutan is uh, for India. So thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, until next time. <laughs>